stuff, I think, um, for the most part. I'm going to uh, kick off with a couple items and then uh, turn it over to Commissioner Shibonet for uh, a public health update. But um, and we'll talk about industries and, and potentially opening and flexing them, some things open. But first we want to talk about a new program we're launching today uh, called ASAP, ASAP COVID Testing, standing for Asymptomatic Spread Assessment Program, uh, a community challenge to really help identify asymptomatic spread around our communities. Now that we've been able to expand our testing capacity, we have a, available for anybody who wants a test, can get a test. We really want to encourage folks, even if you don't have any symptoms at all, to go get that test. Find out. There's just a lot of asymptomatic spread that has been identified, not just here in New Hampshire, but across the country. And uh, we just want to really make sure folks know that those doors are open if you have uh, any sense or, or curiosity even. If you want to know whether you may have COVID or not, it really helps us identify individuals, making sure that you are keeping you, your family, your co-workers, whatever it might be safe, those who you might come in contact with. It's just, uh, again, we've, we have the tools in the toolbox. We want folks to use them. Uh, and again, anyone who wants a test can get a test. So um, if you think that you may be asymptomatic, uh, you can always request a test uh, for our ASAP program by going to the page at nh.gov backslash COVID-19. Again, that's nh dot gov backslash c o v i d one nine uh, and you can just fill out the very simple testing registration form and off you go so um, we just want to encourage everybody in the community that uh, that wants a test to get a test um, also uh, with the main street relief fund uh, huge program i mean really successful so far in that we had a two-week pre-grant app, uh, application process where we received just over 13,000 submissions and uh, pre-grant applications, uh, pre-qualification applications, I should say. Uh, from that, we used some of the initial data that was gathered to generate a formula uh, that we can talk about. Uh, and today, this afternoon, uh, those folks that submitted that pre-grant qualification, because you had to do that to be part of the program, uh, will all be receiving an email this afternoon uh, that will walk them through individually uh, the final grant submission process uh, that will allow them to verify the information that they've given um, and, uh, and again, click send. It kind of lets everybody uh, make sure that the numbers they submitted, uh, whether it's on the revenue side or maybe federal funds they might have received, um, are accurate. Uh, it's all being done through the Department of Revenue Administration, so we want to make sure that there's accountability. We're minimizing the fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, we're working together hand in hand. This final grant submission will allow us to cross-check data such as your taxpayer identification number, things of that nature, uh, over uh, and, uh, and allow uh, us to confirm that you are who you are and the business is, is legitimate and we're minimizing that, that ability for folks to take advantage of the system. Uh, and then move forward. So we have one week uh, at, on Friday, next Friday at midnight, uh, the deadline will close. So everyone will be getting that, uh, uh, the email today with their link in it. And they have one week, it takes about 10, not even 10 or 15 minutes to fill out. It's actually a really uh, streamlined process. And hats off to uh, the whole team at Gopher. Uh, they've been working around the clock on this to get this right. Um, and uh, again, it should be, uh, we, we're, we feel very confident, it should be a very successful program to allow folks to get just some basic funds in to pay rent or mortgage utilities or whatever they need to, to do to keep those businesses floating and thriving uh, as best we can through these tough economic times, to be sure. Uh, some folks are asking about the formula. The formula is actually very, very simple. Uh, we look at the revenues you had last year and the anticipated revenues you have this year. Ideally, you're not ideally, but uh, in theory, you're in the revenues this year would be less because we know that the uh, negative uh, economic impact of COVID has been very severe for a lot of businesses. Uh, you, you take the difference there. We also subtract out any federal funds that you may have received, uh, giving a discount to the folks that got PPP funds as well. Um, and then we divide, we take the $400 million fund and we divide the sum total of all those losses into the $400 million, basically giving you everyone their pro rata share uh, across the spectrum. And the initial qualification parameters that we set out in the beginning still remain today. Under $20 million business, no franchises, no self-employed. Uh, there's other opportunities for them. There's other opportunities for large businesses. Uh, healthcare has been taken out only because they have their own $100 million fund, and that's likely to grow in the future as well. So folks that have their own uh, pathways for other state funds um, have been taken out, and this is really for those Main Street businesses that have really been affected by COVID. So again, uh, if you've submitted your application, uh, keep an eye out for it um, in the, uh, I guess, this afternoon. Um, and then the, the only other thing to act, add, add on to that is what we are doing is also capping. So if you claimed a $10 million loss, you are capped at 350000 for the grant. Uh, that's still a lot of money, can pay a lot of uh, mortgage and debt and 
um, liens or, or property taxes, whatever it might be. Uh, so even uh, the companies that are on the higher end that have experienced se severe loss uh, can still receive a, a decent amount of, of money uh, without really draining down the whole fund. Um, and again, that just seemed like uh, we worked out the math and it, it was a very good balance and allows everybody to get, we think, enough of the dollars in to help recoup some of those losses. So great program. Uh, it's being, uh, the next step is being taken forth today and then we're still on track uh, the week of June 15th. That was always the timeline where we thought the initial checks would be released and we're still uh, you know, shooting to get uh, on that track. Assuming the final grant submissions are in uh, one week from today, we think that we can, we can meet those deadlines. So a uh, very exciting program and just want to thank Go for, uh, for, uh, for making it all happen. Uh, with that, Commissioner, we'll turn it over for you for a public health update. Thank you. Uh, today we are announcing 80 new cases of COVID-19 uh, in the state of New Hampshire for a total of 4,953. Four new hospitalizations for a total of 476 and five new deaths with four of them occurring in our long-term care facilities. We have a total test count of just over 87,000 now since COVID-19 has begun. Um, for long-term care, just a, a couple of updates. Uh, one that we are removing Hackett Hill Nursing Home from our active outbreak li uh, list. They have um, completed their testing and um, the time frame to come off that list. And we will be releasing a full list of those facilities, both active and inactive outbreak um, later today with our daily update. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, a few series of uh, things we want to announce and be able to answer any questions to. Uh, first, beaches. Uh, as many folks may know, uh, this morning uh, I'm, we made an announcement uh, after looking at the data, looking at models in other states, what had happened, looking at what had, had gone on in our own state, the fact that people had been keeping the, the, the distancing um, and there weren't any signs of any significant outbreaks anywhere in the country really, anything of significance uh, in terms of beach activity. It was The decision was made uh, to effective immediately go to and allow more traditional uh, beach activities, whether it be sun, sunbathing, uh, things of that nature. We're still asking folks to keep a, a minimum distance of six feet on the beach. Make sure you have that physical distancing between yourself and maybe your family or other parties that are on the beach. Uh, parking are still going to be limited. Uh, Ocean Boulevard is still going to be uh, shut down. So uh, we're still limiting the number of folks that can be on the beach at any uh, one time. And again, that's another kind of tool we have to help ensure that folks can keep their distancing uh, and make sure that we're not contributing to any of the viral spread. So um, I think a pretty significant uh, uh, development there. And given it's about 85 degrees out, I think it's uh, probably uh, welcomed by a lot of folks across the state. Also, golf. On May 11th, we uh, flexed open golf for New Hampshire residents and club members, and effective immediately, we're moving into what we call phase two of golf, uh, which it basically just includes uh, shortening up uh, the uh, break in between tee times, uh, allowing people from um, uh, separate households to use the same golf cart and, uh, and opening up the golf courses to out-of-state residents. And the reason we're making the step for out-of-state residents is that all the states around us have their courses open. So uh, we're, we have less of a concern of a large amount of folks coming over the border to use our courses uh, because they can use the golf courses in, in their own backyard. And that's uh, uh, another sign that taking these approaches regionally really helps us with the flexibility in terms of moving forward and opening up in, a, I think, in a sensible and reasonable manner uh, while still maintaining uh, the aspects of public safety during the entire COVID-19 outbreak. Also, next up, uh, additional flexing of outdoor recreational guidance around um, other outdoor attractions. Um, some of these are more, um, I guess you could call them tourism type attractions, um, and we're expanding the activities that are currently covered under the outdoor recreational attractions guidance, which is already in place uh, for some attractions, but we're going to include things like batting cages, rope courses, disc golf, Cave, caves, petting zoos, uh, and some other outdoor recreational activities. For a full list of everything that we're moving forward with, uh, please vi visit nh.gov uh, under the Stay at Home 2.0 button so you can get a full list of any additional activities there. Um, when we looked at, at them, they, they have a, a lot of the similarities. Uh, they don't require a large groups working together or, or in, in large conglomeration. Uh, they also are primarily, I think, all outdoor activities, which, again, with the fresh air and, and, and whatnot, I think it provides a lot of um, uh, confidence. Confidence again that we can open these up safely, still really maintaining 
the six foot distances that we're asking folks with physical and social distancing, maintaining good hygiene practices for those facilities, for the staff and employees. A lot of the things that we've really already passed forward and moved forward with our universal guidance. But again, uh, I think it's a, it's a good step forward and, and can't, can't thank the folks at Public Health. They've had some incredible input in, um, in really allowing us to, to take these steps forward in a sensible manner, but also putting in some of the restrictions that uh, aren't too prohibitive in terms of folks enjoying these, these venues, but also allows, the, um, uh, allows us confidence that the, the virus will not spread uh, because of the actions. Uh, also, restaurants. A lot of folks know that we um, took the step to open outdoor dining uh, approximately two or three weeks ago. Um, and while many restaurants continue to operate with takeout and delivery, um, uh, we're going to take another step. Um, and we're doing this one a little differently in that we're taking this um, in, a, in a geographic approach. So beginning on June 15th, so that's about nine days from now, uh, we want to give restaurants time to gear up, plan, make any arrangements they need to make within their facilities. Um, we, what we looked at was the fact that about 85 to 90 percent, in fact it's even higher now, it's about 90 plus percent of the cases, all the COVID active cases are currently in the southern four counties of New Hampshire, being Rockingham, Hillsborough, um, uh, Stratford, and Merrimack County. That's where the vast majority of COVID is. For restaurants within those four counties, they can now open on June 15th at 50 percent indoor capacity. Uh, for restaurants existing in any of the other six counties where, um, again, uh, fortunately, there's very, very fair, uh, there are very few known COVID and active COVID cases, we're allowing them to open up at 100% capacity. Um, again, really trying to take a regional approach, provide opportunity where we can, where we know it's, it's very likely safe. Um, one of the, the ideas here also is that when you're opening up a restaurant, um, one of the fears, if, if I may, is that folks in the higher impacted areas, specifically out of Massachusetts, would come over to the border to use our restaurants and, and as an indoor capacity because they simply don't have that option yet. Um, by really uh, maintaining some limitations on those southern tiers, uh, I think will allow us to better manage and limit the ability for individuals to, um, to come over the border just to use our restaurants, uh, knowing that uh, in the areas where they are right now there's less COVID, there's also a much less likely chance someone's uh, going to drive from Massachusetts all the way up into the lakes region, the mountains, just for the night to, um, to have dinner. So um, uh, we tried to take this from a data standpoint, from a practical implement implementation standpoint. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good step and, and hopefully down the road we can take additional steps um, with our restaurants. Again, you know, within these capacity limitations, we also, just as a reminder, want to uh, make sure folks understand there's still a, a limitation on how close the tables can be. We, we uh, want to keep to a six foot distance there and all the uh, traditional hygiene and mask wearing uh, requirements specifically around the employees uh, obviously still stand as well. Uh, but again, we think this is a logical, a logical next step and pro provides a lot of opportunities for our businesses and most importantly our residents here in New Hampshire in a safe way as it pertains to COVID-19. Uh, also weddings. Um, we have received a lot of phone calls. I've personally received a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails from brides and grooms and mothers of the brides and fathers of the brides. Um, I don't think I've had any fathers of the grooms yet, but I'm sure I'm sure they're coming at some point. Uh, but we do want to uh, we do appreciate that weddings are, are one of those very special moments in an individual's life. It's a one-time event for, for most folks, and uh, they want to make it special. And, and they have a lot of contracts in. They've planned this for sometimes years in advance. Um, and so to uh, maintain that restriction and to find the opportunity to open that up is, a, a, I think, a very big and very important opportunity. We've been working very hard on it. So in conjunction with the opening of restaurants at 50% in the southern tier, uh, we're going to take a similar stance with weddings, to specifically, not the ceremonies, ceremonies can continue of course or already, but with the receptions in that uh, they can be done in venues up to a 50% capacity. Again, also maintaining that six foot buffer, good social distancing. We're really encouraging folks to, to um, really maintain that physical and, and, and social distancing, which we understand is a challenge sometimes uh, during a, um, a, a celebration celebratory event such as a wedding, uh, but it really is important and we think that just allowing this to go forward in some manner uh, with the similar restrictions as, uh, as the, the restaurants have um, is, a, is a sound uh, first step and next step to hopefully allow these events to take place in as safe of a manner as possible.
Also, last week we did report, we did talk about uh, overnight camps. We had, uh, talked about the fact that overnight camps are allowed, going to be allowed, and we finalized the guidance that's available um, now at the Stay at Home 2.0 button under the NH.gov as well. So the guidance on uh, overnight camping, uh, overnight summer camps, not camping, but overnight summer camps, is now available for uh, either the campers themselves uh, or those that are running the camps. Um, and again, those will begin, those um, first campers can begin to arrive on June 28th. Um, I think it's a, a very similar date around a lot of the other states um, that are also allowing overnight camping. Um, so, you know, with these, with these openings uh, and, the, and our ability to flex open, we understand that not every business is really being able to be opened to its fullest. Many are not, frankly. There's a lot of restrictions in terms of capacity, whether you're talking about uh, retail or restaurants or lodging, whatever it might be, we know there's still a lot of limitations out there. But with what we've done today, we've really, um, we, the assessment is that approximately 97, 98 percent of businesses across the state, as of June 15th, will really have that flexibility to open in some fashion. We understand there are still uh, a, still a few industries and venues that uh, are restricted. We've always talked about them as being some of the most challenging, things like movie theaters or large amusement parks that just typically bring in large and large, large amounts of folks um, and by the thousands sometimes, uh, specifically from out of state. So we're working very hard to address those final uh, venues and industries. We hope to have some guidance available for them soon. We appreciate everybody's patience in it. Um, it is very tough. It really is knowing that revenue isn't coming in, jobs are at stake, um, but really taking these steps forward we think puts us um, not just in a, in a good position economically, but still maintaining a good position in terms of safety. That's what this is all about, making sure that we can do these things in a safe way. I'll put our guidance documents up against any's or anyone's around. I mean, we've really spent a lot of time on them, looked at them carefully, worked, on, worked with them directly with public health and CDC, um, and I think we've really constructed something that um, doesn't look at just all of the economy as a whole, but really got into the, the granular detail to understand how each uh, industry is working, get, whole, get a, 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 the stakeholder input, to get those industries input and what they would like to see to flex things open over time, and, trying to, and, and working together to really trying to be able to meet those goals that, uh, that they've put forward um, in as uh, a practical of a manner as possible. And so uh, to the reopen committee, everyone that was part of that, the legislative advisory piece of that committee. Um, uh, the, the commissioner, uh, Shivanet, uh, Dr. Chan, and his whole team at Public Health. I think everyone's just done, frankly, a phenomenal job to, um, to really allow this to, these things to move forward uh, in a, not an arbitrary way, but a safe way with looking at data, other models, uh, and where we are today with our numbers. And then finally, I'll just mention uh, just a kind of a, a repeat of Wednesday. It, uh, we've always said that it is our intent that on June 15th, it's our intent to get this move, allow the stay-at-home order uh, to sunset and transition more into a stay-at-home advisory of some sort um, that has a little more flexibility for folks, a, a, a little more um, uh, opportunity for individuals, uh, move beyond that order, but still allow uh, some of the uh, identification of those that are in those vulnerable health populations, the elderly, what folks with underlying health conditions, those that are simply, those folks that are simply more susceptible uh, to the uh, severe impacts of COVID-19, uh, making sure that we keep an elevated message and, and a warning and caution to those folks to really be careful um, as they, they may go out and about. So um, we really want to focus on those, those uh, vulnerable populations, not just today, not just next week, but uh, definitely into the, um, the, the mid to long term. Uh, as long as COVID-19 is around, those populations will be um, we'll, we'll remain to be very susceptible, and that's where we're going to put a lot of our efforts in terms of our mitigation. Uh, with that, we can then open up to uh, questions if anyone has any questions. Well, the question I've gotten all day is why wait till June 15th? The restaurants, obviously, there's a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. but why not just say, you know, hey, we're doing incredibly better than we thought, other mm -hmm. than the restaurants being really problematic. We're just, it's done now. What's, what's, what, what does safety gain from another nine days? Are, are you talking about in terms of the stay-at-home order yeah, in particular? Because in, other industries probably won't open until after June 15th. Right. Yeah. So, um, because certain, uh, there are certain industries and certain aspects of what we do in our everyday lives where, again, we try to look at this at a very granular level, right? The safety and, and health in, impacts of going into a restaurant at a certain capacity or visiting um, a lodging facility and the, the hygiene that has to be surrounded by that. Uh, the stay-at-home order is again there's a huge value in that keeping it at a very elevated level so people truly appreciate we're in COVID 
Uh, my fear is that when, when this comes off and, and we start really flexing our economy to, the, to its fullest extent, there's going to be a, an idea that we're all okay. We're not. Until we get to a vaccine, we're really not. We have to be very cautious. We want to stay at, an, at that elevated message of caution with ourselves, with our loved ones, with those that are elderly. Um, and the data right now, we've always said we're going to gate it, meaning we're going to take a step and look for a few weeks of data. Take a step and look for a few weeks of data. Um, and so we just extended the stay-at-home order, I believe, a week ago or so. Uh, so again, we want to make sure we have a couple weeks of data before we take the next step. And by June 15th, we'll have that under our belt. And as long as the numbers continue to look good, we're, we're sticking with the plan, I, I guess is that's the best way to say it. I know there's a lot of anxiety on folks to move forward now, but we, have, we had a plan in the beginning. It was the right plan. It's data-driven. We're going to stick to it. We're not going to cave to politics or people yelling on social media, anything like that. It's the right plan. And I think as long as you, 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 we have the wherewithal to stick it out, if you will, follow, follow it from the beginning all the way through to the end, um, I think that gives everybody a lot of confidence that, um, that again, we're going to make the best decisions for the state and walk that, that balanced line. So there's no specific guidance for the weddings on how many people can attend, even though the event is at 50% capacity. That's right. If you have a large venue, and 50% capacity could be 100, 150 people, that's, that's okay? It is, because you, that, uh, that assures that you're having the physical distancing. So it's ba really based on the, the, usually the capacity of a venue is based on the, the square footage sometimes. Um, and, uh, and that, again, if we're doing it 50%, it just gives us a lot of assurance that people can maintain their spacing amongst one another. Then all, not all, you're not cramming 300 people into a venue that only holds 300 people. We've, we've been there before. It gets a little cramped at those tables and whatnot. We want to make sure people have the flexibility that they feel safe that they feel like there's distancing available um, and uh, and yeah so that's that's really where where the the 50 percent comes from well, what's uniquely different in the environment of a wedding reception versus an indoor restaurant in other words yeah not, not much not, yeah not much at all why not have why not open them 100% in those other counties ah, you did with other restaurants. Sure. Uh, good question. So the weddings, just to repeat, the weddings will be maintained at 50% uh, for the entire state. Okay. The reason being is that uh, when you're at a restaurant, you're usually there with, let's say, four or five people from your party. Uh, the idea of interacting with the other party is very, very limited. Um, I typically don't walk around a restaurant and... I may be in campaign season, I'm saying hello to people, but that's, that's obviously not now. But uh, no, so you, you understand, when you're in a restaurant, you're, you're in your own groups. When you're at a wedding reception, you're all together. It could be 50, 60, 100 people of family members from across the country or whatever it might be and all of that. So it's just that is one of the fundamental differences in terms of why we're keeping it at 50% because the uh, um, um, likelihood of interaction amongst those small groups is just b between table to table is just so much higher. Um, and again, we want to... <laughs> We, we want people to enjoy their, their time at their wedding reception and have that opportunity, but again, hopefully maintain that physical distancing as much as, as they can. But it's, that's just the structural difference, um, the inherent difference of, of the two. But you're right. I mean, um, from a physical standpoint, it's similar, but from a how the customer use it, uses the venue, if you will, uh, it's a little different. So we're asking folks to maintain 50% across the whole state. It feels a little absurd to ask, but what about dancing at the weddings? What about dancing at the weddings? There will be no funky chicken allowed in the state of New Hampshire. I am banning it completely. No Macarena funky chicken and Congo lines are out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm not really, but because uh, nobody should be doing that. But um, no, uh, so we are not saying no dancing. Uh, we are strongly discouraging it. We're, strong, we're asking folks to be smart about it. Um, you know, I'm not going to be the guy in Footloose that says no dancing in my town, right? I mean, that's the analogy, I, the best analogy I can give. That's, so that, that would be incredibly hard to enforce. I mean, everything we do, we want to make practical and enforceable and reasonable. And I think the more you keep your guidelines reasonable, the more likely people are to follow those guidelines, take those steps so you can make steps down the road. If you're too restrictive and it becomes impractical, it becomes a joke. We take these guidelines very, very seriously, and we look at them from a very data-specific um, uh, uh, standpoint. So dancing is discouraged, not encouraged, but we're not going to, uh, you know, send the footloose police after you. Uh, the ASAP COVID yes. program, um, is there any funding behind that, or you know, if I sign up, will I be paying out of pocket? Or well, again, for a lot of folks, their insurance will pay for the test. But again, similar to previous, it, it kind of goes in line with what we've done already. There's no financial barriers. If you cannot pay, you, there's, there are methods for the, uh, that payment to happen. If your insurance company has a barrier or will not reimburse, there's a bit availability for that to happen. But most folks, if they have private insurance, they, they will pay. So. Uh, but it's, all, it's the same as we've been doing so far. There should not be any, any financial reason why you shouldn't go get a test. 
So um, the, a couple of press conferences ago, uh, you were asked about executive privilege in your in, in your office. Yes. Uh, and it got me to thinking back. I believe it was, and, and maybe uh, Mr. Lambert can remind me, but I think it was late 2002, early 2003, that Maggie Hassan asked all of her department heads to come back with streamlined budgets, and then she sealed all of the recommendations from her department heads and didn't um, never mm -hmm. released the information. Um, so I apologize, 2012, 2013? I think it was right around that time. Yeah, not 2002, first, 2003. Her first term. Yes, 2012, 2013. Yeah. I just want to make sure so, we get the... So it got me to thinking, yeah. have you started, considering all of the revenue um, projections, yes. have you started asking your department heads to look at streamlining all of their departments? And if you have, will that information be released to the public? Uh, good question. So we've started a process looking at the budgets, first looking at all the programs of the state, looking for programs that might be duplicative between departments. We went through this exercise a, a, about three years ago, um, and we're just kind of taking that exercise again, getting a little deeper in terms of programs or, or um, authorities. Uh, or uh, scope of work for different departments or individuals that, um, that again, hopefully that we can, can be streamlined. And so that's a program assessment that is currently underway. I think it's, it's almost done. Uh, and from there, we'll then look at the opportunities for either finding streamlined uh, ways to uh, may hopefully not cut programs, but if there are, there are projects that have to be delayed, maybe we can go to, to delaying a project. Uh, no real, I, I'm a firm believer that we shouldn't be making any firm decisions on any of it just yet because I, I still believe that, and it looks like a, some sort of a stimulus bill will be coming uh, out of Congress. Um, so that can provide a lot of opportunity. It might provide no opportunity to help backfill some of the revenues. We just don't know. So I, I don't think it would be prudent to start cutting programs today uh, knowing that they might, they might be backfilled tomorrow. Um, you know, because once you make a cut, you make a cut. Um, everything we do, will, we do will be through the legislative process. I can't uh, cut a program without the legislature's uh, approval. And we'll, we'll make sure we, we follow all of that, um, hopefully as they come back or as the fiscal committee might have to come back a few times over the summer if those, if those uh, choices really have to be made. We'll look at capital projects as well, what capital projects can be delayed if we can, again, not say no to a capital project, but may, maybe move it to a year, or one more year out, something like that, just asking for another year's time if the projects aren't on emergency status, maybe that's an ability to, to save some money as well. I've always talked about there are certain programs where we really want to be careful not to, to start going in and cutting and, and holding back too much, specifically around mental health, uh, DCYF, you know, child protection programs, um, uh, programs around um, abuse uh, and domestic sex, sexual and domestic violence issues, um, things that, again, we just know can flare up, SUD programs, addiction. We know those are the types of programs that are, are usually needed the most during tough economic times, and if anything, we'll be putting more money and more emphasis on those programs to make sure that we're ready and prepared uh, um, as we slowly come out of this, the, the, um, the economic doldrums, if you will, as well as out of the stay-at-home order. One thing that we've seen is a lot of folks are still, even though hospitals will take you in for surgery, they're still not going. Um, they're still choosing not to go in yet. There's still some anxiety and some fear there, and it's understandable. Uh, hospitals have all the ability to test. They're incredibly safe. If you need a surgery, if you need a procedure, please go in, see your doctor, see your hospital, get that procedure. We're, we've opened that up because it is safe, um, and, and we want to give people the assur assurance of that. So I think that as it, on a similar uh, level, as we start coming out of the stay-at-home order, we start flexing back into the economy, I think more and more folks will be um, uh, coming out either looking for services or looking for recovery centers and looking for addiction services, things of that nature. I think as kids come back to school, I think we'll have a better assessment of, of what, what has really happened and how they've done over the summer and during remote learning and if additional protection services need to be uh, involved there, uh, we, we're happy to do so. It's always so important to get eyes on a child, see what's happening, have a conversation with them. It can make all the difference in the world. So we're going to make sure that those programs are protected and ready to go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so keeping in that theme of the revenue theme, um, yes. I know you, we all know you have a lot going on, but have you given any thought to how reliant New Hampshire is on other people to basic balance their books and everything else uh, and, and thought about what we can do as a state to not be so reliant, say, on rooms and meals taxes, not be so reliant on anything if, God forbid, we have what really could have happened sure. months ago. 
I think I know what you mean. I, I mean, the way I, I interpret that question and, and the answer that comes to mind is in terms of not being reliant on rooms and meals taxes and all these revenues that come in and can be affected by these issues, it's really about good management, if, if I may. Um, it's really about making sure that you, you're getting rid of those duplicative services, you're streamlining your process. We are a state that I think has done very well with limited government, right, with local control, with things that uh, as individuals we have a lot of say in. The fact that the vast majority of our taxes, our property taxes, can be a burden, to be sure. But it's uh, that allows us to have so much more say in terms of how those dollars are spent and allowing the locals to have a, a lot of say in what's going on in their community, in their neighborhoods. Um, so again, you know, I'm, I think it's been very clear. I'm against the, the, the answer to f solving a budget problem is not just by demanding more money out of people's pockets. That doesn't work because they don't have the money right now. The economy is down. You should not be looking to any broad-based taxes ever. You should not be looking to an income tax ever. You should not be looking to increase business taxes on businesses when they're going through tough economic times. It makes no logical sense. But good management wins the day. I, I really believe that. We've been very successful with that process in the past, and I think we'll be successful in the future. I have a question actually for the commissioner. Sure. So uh, your counterpart in Minnesota issued a statement to people participating in the Greg Floyd or, or George Floyd protest saying if you participate in the protest please get tested yesterday the CDC chairman Redfield did the same thing he, uh, they call them a, a venue for spread a cause for spread a recipe for spread are you going to issue any uh, guidance to the people who have protested thus far I know this stands a large gathering in Concord tomorrow mm -hmm. Are you, are you, do you have a message for those people, and is the state going to take any action? So I know some states, like Rhode Island, are actually passing out masks, having sure. employees show up at the rallies sure. and encourage people to distance. Sure. So um, the 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 rallies and the protests and things like that, um, we consider in the same grouping of any type of large uh, congregate uh, um groups or, or crowds or things like that so um, we're not going to issue a formal statement but we will definitely say that if you think that you've been at risk for exposure to COVID then you should go get tested whether that is at a protest or if that is at a beach or a restaurant or anywhere else if you think you've been exposed or you think you're at risk then you should get tested Two seventy-eight deaths. Are we still on those? Nearly all of those have been uh, chronic medical conditions. To yes, the vast majority. And yep. real quick, um, yesterday, what? Well, sorry, uh, Wednesday, uh, you had the, the, uh, the almost nearly three thousand tests. It's the most in almost two weeks. Is that because of that uh, going back to all of the long-term care facility Sentinel? I think you called it where you, you're going to go back and retest everything. Is that why that was I don't so know. Huge? I don't know what exa exactly what day you're talking about. Oh, the so third? the third, yes, 2800. We're at for for testing numbers for that day. So that is not Sentinel, but it's probably baseline. So the uh, a large majority of our testing right now is coming out of long-term care facility. Both the baseline testing from last week. Um, the Sentinel testing that we started this week and the Sentinel testing will uh, will continue for the next several weeks and we'll reassess that about the fourth round is our plan for reassessment. But you can expect to see continued bump in those numbers from long-term care facility testing. Can I just follow one more? So how come there was like this kind of slope in the numbers down yep. the past week and a half? So there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, oftentimes when you have uh, some low numbers, often the the test day that's reported out is not the same as the specimen collection day, right? So if your test day is on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, if it's a holiday, right? Uh, physicians' offices are closed, things like that. You're going to see specimen collections drop, and so you'll see a couple days that you have low tests. Um, the other thing that happens sometimes, our system went down one day. That that that'll bring the numbers down. Um, we get a backlog in our tests uh, because we unexpectedly get a whole bunch in, so we spend more time doing data entry, which takes time away from the actual testing. So a variety of factors play into that, um, but that's why it's really important that we look at the average over a week, right? And that's what we, because if we have an off day, you're going to see the offset on that on either side of that day. And, and just one more, I'm sorry. So, okay. But you're, you wouldn't say then that it's people not coming forward to take testing or taking this seriously or anything like that, that would be a, I mean, are you having, it's really just management of everything, it's right? So, so I, I would say that, you know, initially when we started off the fixed testing sites that we saw huge demand for our tests, we were, 
Um, our phones are ringing off the hook for five straight days. We just could not keep up with the phone volume and the in the website volume. Um, after that initial bump, things leveled off and things are leveled off right now. We are um, we are are doing enough tests, but we're not we're not at capacity by any means. We we probably have enough test uh, spots in each testing location that if you call today you could get a test tonight so we're steady but we're not overloaded at all um, so i would say that our demand right now is equaling our supply which is where we wanted to get to is that that supply demand be equal so people don't have to wait for a test um, so that means we have enough resources out there for the people that want testing. A lot of uh, non-symptomatic people coming in, and are you kind of surprised that the rate remains at or below 5%? Does that surprise you as a health professional? Um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, I think you know, what what did surprise me. Instead of what doesn't surprise me, I'll tell you what did <laughs> surprise me. What surprises me is the amount of asymptomatic long-term care residents that we're seeing. So when we go into a facility that has had maybe one or two symptomatic people, and we test all of the residents, even some of our residents that are in their 80s and 90s with co-occurring or co-occurring uh, uh, co conditions or underlying conditions have no symptoms so it's still that struggle of what are the conditions that that um, put you on a trajectory for a negative outcome versus the ones that you can just have COVID and not have symptoms and we're seeing that a lot in nursing homes and that is surprising and on the ASAP testing could you learn something from that that would lead to a change in policy or what, what could you learn from that, that I think I think every um, Every pattern we identify in the community allows us to reevaluate the data and pivot on our strategy. And that's what we try to do, right? So the more data we get out of every single community, the more we can say, oh, there's a pattern of illness or there's a pattern of asymptomatic positive in this small town in the western part of the state. And being able to identify that, do the contact tracing back to another event could tie us to another group of people. And that's what we're really trying to do is um, really gauge the degree of tra uh, community transmission. And one way to do that is through the asymptomatic positive because we know there's a lot out there. Have there been any of the cases of staffers who brought in, who, who may have been asymptomatic, brought it in, you found them out later, who then uh, could be traced back to, say, clusters similar to the donut shop in Salem a few weeks ago, where you had, um, you put out the alert on that, or are, is it all random, they're just randomly meeting, traveling or meeting people who have gotten, who contracted it to? So there's definitely clusters of illness. I mean, we can definitely look in our contact tracing and find how um, people came in contact. You know, if we have a cluster of illness, like you said, at a donut shop, and we talked to three people in that community and they all visited that donut shop, you know, the week of X, we can make some assumptions about that. Um, but we do know that there's widespread community transmission, so you're, you're, there's a possibility that you're gonna, you, you can come in contact with it almost anywhere. But we do try to look in our contact tracing to see if we can find one specific area or perhaps even an outbreak that is happening at a, a business or uh, certainly household family members when you see cookouts things like that happening over Memorial Day weekends and people coming from other homes or or family from out of town coming and then um, seeing COVID positive from those family members you certainly can trace that back. Has there been a death yet from someone under 60 without a comorbidity? Um, I would have to check. There are de there are definitely death under the age of 60. Um, I don't have the details on their on the degree of their uh, underlying health conditions. Thank you very much. We'll go. Uh, to, oh, sorry. I, you have one more. Then we'll go to the phones. You've been very outspoken about uh, where you stand on the George Floyd protests. There's a developing story out of Manchester this afternoon. The mayor and seven aldermen are calling on two other aldermen to resign based on some social media posts that included racial slurs. One alderman suggested that protesters should be uh, moved out of town with a big plow truck. Uh, do you agree uh, that those two individuals, those aldermen, should resign over those comments? Uh, I, I, I haven't seen the exact comments, so I forgive me. Uh, but I will say um, anyone using that kind of what was expressed here 
that kind of language, that kind of sentiment, anything of a racial nature in a negative way, um, yes, there, there's no place for that at all in, in anything that we do. But I apologize, I haven't seen the, were they tweets or social media posts? Uh, it was a Facebook back and forth, I think. Okay. I, I, I apologize, I can't speak to the specifics. But so one of the things... But there's no, just to be clear, no place for any of that. Yeah. So you spoke very passionately one week ago today when the George Ford story was new and mm. people were kind of surprised you're stopping a COVID event to talk about another event because you felt so strongly about the, the death of this gentleman in uh, Minnesota. Mm. Since then, there have been at least two police officers killed. There have been numerous civilians killed by rioters who are associated with or, yeah. you know, in, in the, the things that are happening in the night, some people mix the protest. But there have been violence that have been very destructive and police officers yeah. have died and hundreds of stars have been injured. You haven't issued a statement yeah. about that violence or those consequences. A statement in terms of the riots and the you violence. We've been about talking about that all week. To talk about well, don't. Death, which was tragic, okay, let's be very clear. Deaths and hundreds yeah, of the violence and the rioting that has resulted in injuries and death across this country. We've been talking about all week, and we've been preparing to make sure that doesn't happen here. I think uh, first and foremost, let me just give a hats off to our local communities, whether it be on the law enforcement side. The folks that are organizing these events have done a phenomenal job, and we're very fortunate so far that none of that has happened here. But we've been talking about that that violence uh, all, all week in terms of uh, the, how terrible it is. You have, um, again, individuals losing their lives. Uh, obviously, the George Floyd, um, the murder of George Floyd was a very specific event that uh, has triggered off a national and nationwide uh, call to action, which I think is very appropriate. And obviously, that's going, that, that issue is, is kind of the driver of the day, but it, uh, it doesn't undermine or, or diminish the, the importance of or the, the lives that have been lost or the people that have been injured, the businesses that have been destroyed, all of the tragedy we've seen over the past, um, you know, week it's just been it's been unbelievable it's been unprecedented and uh, you want to hope that there's an end to it at some point um, I mean the protesters have a voice I believe um, the, the final uh, wake or funeral is going to happen uh, sometime next week I believe and and I imagine there'll be um, a lot of uh, of a similar outcry um, for for change, constructive change surrounding that, and maybe even after. But uh, we're going to be prepared here in New Hampshire. Uh, we're going to make sure that we're protecting our citizens and, and, and the lives um, of individuals here, the businesses here, whatever it might be. But um, it's been a lot. You're right. You're absolutely right. There's been a lot of stories out there across this country of, uh, of people losing their lives and being killed, uh, frankly, for what I, I think a lot of us would agree are completely unnecessary reasons. Um, and uh, I think that just underlines the severity of the situation. Do you have a specific uh, proposal that you'd like to see the legislature advance when it comes to policing, trying to stop police abuses? Representative Byrd had a piece that was uh, yeah. a piece of legislation that was endorsed by all the entire all the Republicans, and uh, it's now there's a version of the Senate that they're considering. In this great. Do yeah. you support that legislation? And do you have your own? proposals for? Yeah, so I, I've, I've seen at least the first draft of that legislation, and it's all on the right path. It really is. Uh, we have, we're taking other steps. Um, I was sitting with uh, uh, Colonel Noyes, uh, Commissioner Quinn, um, some uh, folks from uh, the uh, churches and parishes uh, across the state, the community leaders, if you will. Um, what we, I think, need to do, um, if you go back to when, we st when I created the Diversity and Inclusion Council um, and the commission that, again, was charged with really going around the state, talking about things of implicit bias, talking to schools or communities, find, getting the feedback, finding out uh, what, their, um, what the ideas and thoughts were out there, where there might have been some of this... Um, uh, inequity, whether it be on a racial or by um, sexual identity, whatever it might might be, inequities can exist socially in, in our societies in a lot of different ways, and I think they did a, a very good job with that. We created the Civil Rights Unit in, in the Attorney General's office. No governor had ever done that. We, we jumped right on top of it and made sure it got done, so that is another tool in the toolbox, but I think it has to go deeper. Um, we talked about, now that we have a new Director of Police Standards and Training, the opportunity to really update those programs and that training within uh, for those who don't know, we're one of the few states in the country that have a single point for all police standards and training. Everyone gets trained essentially by the same organization, so there's continuity between state police, local police, corrections officers, whatever it might be, and that's a huge uh, asset to us because you can create a, really make sure you're updating your program in a singular fashion and everyone's getting that same training and keep it updated, not let it go go um, uh, antiquated. And I, my sense is what is there now is antiquated and, and does have to be updated, but not just talking to the leaders and organizers of these events, but the community leaders that, um, again, I think can, we can create a, a better opportunity of being more, uh, more systematic, if you will, with making sure 
we're integrating ourselves with the issues in these communities, not just Manchester and Nashua, but every city and town. We have 220 cities and towns. Every city and town, we should be talking to the schools and the community leaders, uh, the law enforcement, whatever it might be, because it's not just a law enforcement issue. It's our culture that really needs to, to wake up to the 21st century. And, and um, it's, un it's unfortunate that it takes the murder of some of these individuals to to get us to move forward, um, but we're taking it very seriously, and I think we're making, uh, we have some plans to make some, some great steps. So uh, it was, we had a great discussion yesterday. We're going to get to, we've had good discussions with community leaders. We've had good discussions on a whole variety of levels. Um, discussion is good, but action is better. And I think the legislative act, action you talked about is, is a great step, uh, but there's some other stuff we can do too. We're not going uh, to settle, if you will. You know? Let's take some on the phone if we could. The first question comes from Holly Raymer with Associated Press. Holly? Go ahead with your question. Hi, thanks. Um, I have one um, public health question and then one follow-up on the accountability. Um, in terms of the ASAP program, will you be reporting that data separately in terms of showing how many asymptomatic people are testing positive? Um, and then if you, it turns out you have a huge number of people who are participating in that program, could that make the um, percent positive Uh, so I, I don't know the second bill as well as I know the first bill, so I'm going to answer the, the back questions first and then we'll talk about ASAP. Um, the two bills that you're, you're talking about, the, the one with the citizen engagement, I have to uh, admit I don't, I, don't, I, haven't, I don't know that bill as well as the bill that uh, was specifically talking about uh, making sure that um, there's a pathway uh, for police officers and a requirement for, for police officers to report uh, abuse, essentially, and, and abusive situations. So, um, and, you know, whether you want to call it police brutality or whatever it might be, and, and um, yes, so we're very very much in favor of that process. Uh, we got to look at the bill, and, and uh, but in its draft form, uh, very much uh, that, that would make very logical sense to take uh, steps like that. That, unfortunately, as we saw the, with the murder of George Floyd, you had other officers just standing there watching, uh, basically, uh, and that's not acceptable in any way. That essentially, I believe, it makes them accomplices. I'm not a lawyer, but um, so we have to make sure that there is accountability within their system, uh, to be sure. Um, on the ASAP side, I'll say that uh, and I'll, I can, if Commissioner Shibinet wants to answer, she, she can as well. Um, it's so hard to, when folks come in to take a test, I, Commissioner, do we ask whether you're asymptomatic or not? Yeah, we don't really define asymptomatic versus symptomatic right now because early on we found that it was such a gray area. Um, you know, I had a, a light cough a couple days ago. Is that symptomatic or not? We, you know, it's, you're not quite sure. So um, what, one thing we're very um, cognizant of uh, through this whole process is we want to get the data right. And we, what we don't want to do is ask, or ask individuals around the state and all the testing facilities to collect data in a non-consistent way and asking folks to the level of their symptoms, it, it's very subjective. So long story short is um, it's, we likely are not going to be able to determine this population uh, of asymptomatic versus this population of symptomatic. What ASAP is, the, um, uh, the system-wide approach, is really a call to action to just really raise the level of awareness that anybody can get a test. We want you to go get a test, even if you're asymptomatic. Uh, we want you to go out and, and get those tests and know what's going on for your safety and the safety of the community and, and those folks around you. So it's really just a, kind of a, an elevated extension of what we're already doing. Uh, but it doesn't, we, we won't be able to necessarily uh, report that data separately. When you don't check the box, I'm part of this program or that program, we just want you to go get a test and everyone's included in the data. The next question comes from Tom East, Eastman with the Conway Daily Sun. Tom, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Uh, Hi. Thanks for taking the question. Hi. Uh, you know, up in our neck of the woods, uh, the attractions that you referred to earlier, uh, terms and based businesses such as the Conway CNX and Mount Washington on the road. Uh, what type of guidance uh, is going to be clear after June 15th? Will it be a July 1st opening? Do you have any idea at all when 
places like Stewart Land and Conway Scenic and the Yard Road, uh, to name a few, when they would be reopening. Or a lot of the open with safe social distancing and other practices. Sure. So I'll answer. I believe the auto road is part of our list today. That is uh, open effective immediately because, again, you're, you're in a car. There's obviously natural social distancing uh, and physical distancing available there. Things like the railroads, the scenic railroads, um, we think we'll have guidance out soon. We're looking at how each of those work. We don't have many of them, but they're all a little bit different, whether it's the Cog Railway or the Hobo Railroad or the Scenic Railroad. There's a couple of them there, but uh, we're looking at both capacity issues, whether they can be done in a more outdoor ventilated uh, atmosphere, um, um, uh, seeing uh, just kind of how they work. Other Sometimes in, in those railroad situations, there's other activities that happen uh, typically on the train. So we're trying to be as specific as we can, and, and hopefully within the next week or so we'll have some guidance for them. And then, of course, is the amusement parks, as you referenced, uh, Storyland or the water parks. Uh, sp speaking to, um, you know, the North Country, you know, Conway has a water park or water country or, or down on the southern tier with um, – uh, Kennedy Lake Park. I'll say Kennedy Lake Park came in and, and gave a great presentation. I mean, a really, really good presentation uh, to the Open Up uh, New Hampshire Committee, and I think it's has provided some a good backbone for some guidance that we're trying to build off of and get them there. I I originally said I don't know how you how we're going to do it, but I got to tell you, I think people have have um, the data is still continues to be very good. The data in Massachusetts continues to get better. That's one of the biggest concerns of those larger. Um, uh, um, amusement park venues is that you're going to get a lot of out-of-staters, specifically Massachusetts, coming up. So as we see Massachusetts numbers continue to drop, that's they're still high, of course, but they continue to drop, which allows us, um, to, I think, more confidence as we go a week, two weeks, three weeks down the road. Um, we're we're kind of, everyone's getting closer to zero, hopefully, and in um, and, and, and a much more manageable situation. Uh, and that will allow us the confidence to, to hopefully make those steps. So we haven't made any final guidelines yet or final determination, but uh, we also appreciate that at a certain point in the summer if you don't open those venues they're closed for good because it doesn't make sense just to have a, a tiny fraction of, of the summer they want to keep if not the whole summer which obviously probably isn't possible at this point but a, a good majority of it not lose some of those key weekends to make it economically viable to open at all so we we appreciate that we've heard that message and, and again we'll try to meet those deadlines as, as as best we can but again it's all going to be done uh, by looking at the data and and making sure whatever we do doesn't cause some of those um, super cluster spreader events or at least minimizes the uh, opportunity for that so if it were to happen, our healthcare system and our entire uh, management testing uh, management system is, is there to um, to handle whatever might come. The next question comes from Paula Tracy with In Depth. Paula, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I have a question about when we can visit nursing homes. Um, I also have a question about um, when we might be able to visit the issue of community pools, whether outdoor gyms have been considered and finally um would you consider testing yourself Sure. So um, I think the first question uh, had to do, sorry, what was the first one, Paula? Oh, oh, the, the important one, the nursing homes. No, of course, and long-term care facilities. Other states uh, around us have started looking at, at uh, models to allow visitation to long-term care facilities. Um, I think I speak for everyone when, we, uh, when I say that we appreciate how important this is. Uh, there's other individuals in a lot of these facilities. Um, you know, other than the staff, they've really been alone. There's a mental health aspect to it. They want to see family. Family wants to see them getting eyes on a loved one is so so important and um, and so we're going to be looking at some of those models that are currently being implemented I think in parts of Massachusetts even um, to see if we can we can get there obviously testing is a big part of that um, the the sentinel testing and the uh, continual testing of those facilities so we can constantly monitor who may be positive or negative I think we want to make sure that that is up and running and we have full capacity around that opportunity before we we open that up but we definitely appreciate it's something that probably has to happen sooner than later and we were talking about it today um, and and different options and opportunities, looking at some of the ways it's, it's being done. It's being done a little differently across the country, so we're looking at some of those models and figuring out how best it would, would work here. Uh, you mentioned co uh, community pools, for example. So most community pools are really regulated by the towns or the cities themselves. Um, we ha right, right now have a limitation of, of 10 individuals in a, in a group setting. Um, our hope, it is not a, a firm by any means, but it, it is our hope that when 
The stay-at-home order, if we can get to the point on June 15th where that would go to some type of advisory, we could also look at potentially increasing the, the size of gatherings, and that would uh, coincide with, with pools. I mean, if pools wanted to do small groups, community pools wanted to do small groups right now, they, they technically could. Um, it's really the towns that regulate whether those pools are open uh, for outdoor uh, activities or not. And then, again, if we can get to the point where we're increasing those group sizes, that obviously increases the opportunity. Um, what will you add? Uh, I think you asked if I was going to, I am going to get tested as part of the ASAP program. We're going to kick it off this weekend, and uh, I am going to get tested. So we want to encourage test. everybody to go. Yeah, I haven't been tested yet. Yeah. I'm pretty healthy stock. So I'm asymptomatic, so you don't need to back off or anything. No, we really, again, it's part of the program. Even though I, I don't have a symptom at all, haven't had it, thank God. Uh, knock on wood, we, you know, I'm, I've been pretty curious. I'd, I'd love to know whether, whether I have it. And just to, you know, hopefully encourage other folks to take this uh, similar steps. So. I, I like to see that you're wearing your mask, Michael. Now, Paula, did you have one other there? Did I miss something as part of your question? I apologize. Outdoor gyms. Oh, outdoor gyms and gyms. So, um, outdoor gyms. So, we, we, we are one of the uh, first states in, in the Northeast to really allow these uh, more structured gym settings of yoga classes or boot camps and things of that nature. Um, they can take place outdoors as well or, or in a gym. So, we don't discern whether it's inside or outside. Um, I think in terms of having you know folks inside running on the treadmill, I know there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of angst to get that going again. Uh, nowhere in the Northeast is that happening. Nowhere. And um, so we have to be cautious of that uh, going forward because of the nature of that activity, the heavy breathing, the sweating, the close contact that folks can have, the um, hygiene issues that can surround that. Um, we have tremendous facilities here in New Hampshire, some of the best in the country, and, and we, whether it's Planet Fitness or some of the private ones, I mean, just phenomenal. And so we want to get those open, but um, there is an inherent challenge there. So um, we'll work both within our state and, and also look at if there's better, good models that come out of other parts of the country or other parts of the Northeast. But given that we're in such a hot spot area, no one's taken that step yet, but, um, but we'll always look for opportunities to do it. The next question comes from Todd Bookman with New Hampshire Public Radio. Todd, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Governor, I have two questions about the Main Street Relief Fund. First, did you consider weighting the fund toward industries that we know are the hardest hit? I'm thinking restaurants and hotels. And the second question is, how will business owners who may have applied with multiple LLCs be treated? So uh, the question is, do we consider weighting it towards industries that are the hardest hit? The answer is no, but it is inherently built in the formula in that industries that are hardest hit will have some of the biggest losses. And th the formula is, uh, takes your, gives you a pro rata share of that loss. So um, in an industry that's not as hard hit, maybe they only lost 10, you know, 20 or 30 percent of their uh, expected revenue, uh, they'll get a, a share of that 10 or 20 percent, whereas a, a restaurant or a hotel that might be losing 50 or 60 percent, they're going to get a 10% a of that loss. So it's inherently built into the formula, so it didn't require uh, a weighting system. Uh, I apologize. I, it's Friday. What was the second question? LLC. Oh, multiple LLCs. Yes. So if you have, um, we tie all businesses to a single owner. So if a, there is a single owner that has multiple businesses, as long as they come all with under, in, in, in aggregate, come under the $20 million threshold, they can apply. from Harrison Thorpe with the Rochester Voice. Harrison, go ahead. Yeah. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I have uh, three quick questions. One is, you mentioned restaurants in North Country can open at 100%, but if their tables are six feet apart, they probably won't be anywhere near that. And we're looking for the same thing down here in Stratford and Rockingham County. So when it comes time for them to flex over at 100%, you might want to guess how many percentage of people they'll actually be able to have there. Uh, secondly, uh, can you tell me if live music is now allowed, like bands, or will it be soon? And lastly, uh, what about social clubs like the American Legions and uh, VFWs? Okay, great question. So. Um, we do still have the limitation of the six foot width between tables uh, to allow for the physical distancing, even in areas where we can allow you to open up to 100%. Um, I don't know the physical, uh, what, what we decided and realized was we don't know the physical setup of every restaurant by any means. Some restaurants can open at 100% with that physical distancing. Some may be capped a, a little less because uh, maybe they're just more naturally tightly fit. And again, you, you have to do, uh, do adhere to the six foot distancing. So we appreciate that um, some may not get completely up to 100%. 
Um, but, um, but again, that's, it's, it's just a step. We're hoping to take additional steps down the road. On the American Legion side, things of that nature, uh, yes, they can open up at the, that 50% capacity um, as long as they, they serve food. And, you know, if it's a bar or whatever, yeah, you do have to be able to serve food in those venues. Um, and then I, there was a question in the middle. Uh, live bands. Oh, live, live bands. bands. I have to be honest. I don't know if that was discussed, but we, I will take a look at that. I'll go back and look if that was uh, undertaken in the guidance. And if it wasn't, we'll try to make stipulations for it. Oh, it was? Okay, I'm, I'm getting a head nod that it was. So um, it is in the guidance, it, it appears. But I'll take a look at it anyway. It's a very good question. The next question comes from Rick Jurgens with the Valley News. Rick, go ahead with your question. Thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, the Sentinel surveillance testing in nursing homes, I understand the intention is to uh, expand that to assisted living facilities as it moves forward. My question is, uh, there's, there's uh, 2,400 uh, uh, state prison inmates. There's only 23 of them have been tested. Uh, amazingly, only one, one positive. Uh, is there any intention to uh, expand sentinel surveillance testing into the uh, prison and jail population? And I guess if not, why not? Okay, so Sentinel surveillance program, we're going to uh, make it work with nursing homes first. We want to perfect it. We want to make it uh, so that we've worked out any bugs uh, related to it. Once we do that uh, and we get through a couple of rounds, we will look at our next, uh, our next contract amendment to open it up to assisted living. The reason why we would do assisted living um, prior to jails and prisons is because the population has a higher risk for negative consequences when you're over the age of 60 with underlying conditions. That represents mostly nursing homes and assisted living. Um, I would not rule out additional surveillance programs after assisted living. If, con if COVID continues to be a problem, which I expect that it's going to be, um, other populations that we will look at will be um, uh, homeless shelters, uh, people that are unsheltered and uh, frequent homeless shelters, um, p jails, prisons, and any other type of congregate type housing that don't does not fall with think community residences for people with disabilities, things like that. So uh, we're prioritizing the people in our community that are at highest risk for negative outcomes, which are people that are in congregate settings with underlying conditions, which are nursing homes and assisted livings. Thank you. I think that's good on the phone. We have a couple more, Adam. Just your reaction to the Superior Court order today in uh, Mary Jane Walder et al. versus Christopher T. Yeah. Uh, just it's a great result. Yeah. I mean, they, I think uh, my understanding is the judge uh, said uh, that under their new uh, submittal that they do have standing, but that he wouldn't imp uh, impose an injunction because they don't, the, the case doesn't really have merit. Um, I think they're going to allow some final procedural you know, you can have a kind of a last say in there, but uh, his statement uh, that surrounds the um, the fact that he wouldn't put an injunction in, I think, says it all. That you know, that they really don't have merit going forward, and we did it right. My Twitter feed is full of people who were outraged that you would ban the macarena and the funky chicken, but leave who are you the friends with? Who is who are you friends They're with on Facebook? You to declare the hokey pokey a COVID emergency and ban it from all weddings as well. I can't do it. I cannot. I, oh, they want me to ban the hokey yes, pokey? Yes, oh, well, yes, sure. Let's ban the hokey pokey, too. Yeah, I thought they wanted that implied. I'm not putting the Macarena back in. I, I've never danced the Macarena. Let's just put that on the record to be sure. Yeah. Real quick clarification. Are you expecting in, um, in June 15th to not lower the uh, gatherings of uh, 10 or, or more? In other words, um, so... Um, adult recreation softball leagues who have 25 or 30 people show up for a game would not be allowed. Are you expecting that not to happen in June? Uh, I don't know. On June 15th, in terms of the question is, are we going to move the number from uh, social groups of 10 to, to larger to than what? that? Uh, the, possibly, yes, okay, possibly. I think we really want to, i got to be honest, I haven't made that decision yet. Uh, I, I want to keep working with public health, make sure the data stays where it is. We keep getting good numbers, and that's on a good track, but that's a, um, that would be a big deal. Uh, and so we, I think we want to kind of uh, wait till, till kind of as long as we can to make sure we get that one right. Okay. 
Well, I won my $1 bet with my staff. They said it would only go 59 minutes or less, and uh, unfortunately we had a, an hour and nine minutes. So we appreciate everyone staying through. Uh, it is a Friday afternoon. Have a safe and happy um, uh, weekend. Uh, the summer is upon us. Um, in these tough, even with these tough times, there's always something to smile about. There's always a, a rainbow somewhere, as we say, and it, uh, it really is important to, to find those, um, those moments in our lives and in our communities and with our families, with our coworkers, whatever it is that puts a smile on our face in such tough times. So we appreciate appreciate New Hampshire doing an outstanding job through this entire COVID process, an outstanding job uh, through these protests that we've seen um, and the call for social justice, the right call for social justice. And New Hampshire just handled it really, really well. And we just want to thank all the citizens um, uh, from the top on down for, um, for doing it and, and being that gold standard that uh, we've come to expect from ourselves. So thank you guys so much and have a safe and happy weekend.